In 1956, Canadair's chief designer, Frederick Phillips, came up with a radical new aircraft design. With the help of fellow employee Carlos Irbitas, the two set out to create revolutionary technology that is still used to this day. The Dynavert, or CL-84 as it was known in Canadair, is capable of taking off and landing vertically like a helicopter and could also fly like a conventional aircraft using groundbreaking mechanics invented by Irbitas. The possibilities were endless, and the aircraft had the potential to be used for military transport, reconnaissance, and other tactical roles. It would be tested and developed for almost 20 years, proving that this new technology could be a formidable addition to any air force in the world. Ultimately, the Dynavert CL-84 turbine tilt-wing monoplane was the first aircraft to generate worldwide interest in the VSTOL technique. Canada's own VSTOL. Vertical and or short takeoff and landing aircraft, or VSTOL, can take off and land in almost any kind of terrain. Their ability to perform maneuvers that are otherwise impossible for conventional aircraft gives their operators an advantage when used in active combat situations. VSTOL was developed to allow jet-powered aircraft to operate in forest clearings, short or unavailable runways, and small carrier vessels that would otherwise only carry helicopters. However, this aircraft is quite hard to come by, as most VSTOL aircraft developments have resulted in failure, especially those built during the Cold War. Many countries' air forces have tried making their own version of this aircraft, and Canada was not the exception. The de Havilland Canada DHC-5 Buffalo, introduced between 1965 and 1974, was the Royal Canadian Air Force's primary search and rescue aircraft. However, it was not the first experience they had with such technology. Around the same time, a Canadair manufacturer experimented with an aircraft strikingly similar to the Bell Boeing's V-22 Osprey. In fact, the CL-84 Dynavert is considered the world's first successful tilt-wing aircraft and the first to generate attention around the world. In 1956, Frederick Phillips, Canadair's chief designer, proposed the radical aircraft's design supported by fellow creator Carlos Irbitas. Both envisioned a versatile military aircraft capable of transport, reconnaissance, and other tactical roles. The aircraft's research and development period lasted almost five years, even before building the first prototype. Made in conjunction with the National Research Board and the Defense Research Board of Canada, the investigation helped produce a unique design incorporating several significant innovations in aviation. Innovations Both the wing and the power plants of the aircraft could be tilted hydromechanically to change the wing incidence through 100 degrees from an ordinary flight angle to allow for vertical and short takeoff and landing. This tilt-wing capability was achieved thanks to Irbitus, who created a unique gear mixing box consisting of an arrangement of cams and levers that allowed the pilots to use the same control movements regardless of the wing's position. This way, the airmen wouldn't need extra training to fly the aircraft. In addition, the design incorporated a stability augmentation system to reduce pilot workload in low-speed flight conditions. Meanwhile, the aircraft's engines, rotors, and tail rotors were all connected by intricate shafts and gearboxes. The airframe underwent extreme scale model testing in wind tunnels to ensure the design's feasibility and decide on its optimal shape and size because of the lack of experience with VSTOL. By the end of 1963, the test had accumulated 1,500 hours at several wind tunnels, such as the National Research Council in Ottawa, the San Diego Convair facilities, and McDonnell Aircraft St. Louis headquarters. The CL-84 Dynavert was also one of Canadair's first aircraft to use analog computers and a cockpit mock-up to create a realistic flight simulator. This proved to be an effective tool that was essential in designing the cockpit controls and future models. Canadair Manufacturer was a subsidiary of General Dynamics at the time, and they christened this new aircraft as the Dynavert. However, the Canadair engineers referred to it as 84. Prototype After completion of the lengthy research and development stage, the prototype phase began. Like Lockheed Skunk Works Lab, Canadair's engineers and scientists communicated exhaustively to supplement the sparse prototype drawings and illustrations. The final result was a large machine with a maximum height of 14 feet 7 inches, with its wings covering a total area of 71 square feet. Although the CL-84's empty weight was 7,450 pounds, the aircraft could be loaded to up to 1,488 pounds for a vertical takeoff and landing mission, while a short launch or conventional mission could be accomplished with a massive 3,570 pounds. After spending two years in the construction stage, the prototype flew for the first time in May of 1965 and had its first conventional flight by December. On January 17, 1966, the prototype made its first transition flight at Canadair's Montreal facilities. The tests showed that the CL-84, just like every other VSTOL-capable aircraft, 
could take off and land like a helicopter, and then as a regular aircraft when changing the position of its wings and engine mid-flight. Flown by pilot W.S. Longhurst, this promising feat was achieved seven months ahead of the original schedule in snowy weather with 25 mile per hour winds. A decade of tests. For the next 10 years, the aircraft would continue to be tested with pilots from the Canadian Armed Forces, the Royal Air Force, the United States Navy, and NASA. During its first two years alone, the first prototype was flown by 16 aviators for over 145 flying hours. And for the most part, the feedback was overwhelmingly enthusiastic. On September 18, 1966, on the model's 115th flight, the CL-84 became the first aircraft to simulate a rescue of a live subject from land by a VSTOL aircraft. Maintaining a steady rock position and hovering 40 feet in the air, the operators lowered a standard rescue sling towards the subject, who was then hoisted up with the cable back to safety. Further tests included minigun firing, joint operations with a helicopter at sea, and hover downwash tests. However, in September of 1967, the prototype crashed on its 360th flight while flying in a forward velocity mode at 175 miles per hour at a 3,215 foot altitude. The aircraft had begun to yaw to the left and subsequently pitched downward. Although both crew members ejected safely, the aircraft plowed into an open field nearby, catching fire and burning to the ground. After the incident, Canadair proceeded to build three additional prototypes with several design changes to maximize performance. The models were built between 1968 and 1970, and their testing would occur over 20 years after Frederick Phillips and Carlos Irbidas first began their research work into VTOL technology. Trials abroad. The second prototype, CL-84-1, made its maiden flight on February 19, 1970, with pilot Bill Longhurst at the controls. After his retirement, Doug Atkins assumed the role of chief test pilot. With the Vietnam War in full swing, the United States Navy became impressed with the aircraft's performance and expressed interest in the project. Thus, Pilot Atkins was sent on a cross-country tour with all expenses paid to show off the Dynavert. The aircraft would eventually land on the White House lawn, travel to Norfolk, Virginia, Edwards Air Force Base, and finally land on USS Guam to perform trials on the carrier. The Dynavert performed flawlessly and proved its VSTOL versatility in front of top American officials. During these tests, in August of 1973, this model was also lost when a catastrophic failure in the left propeller gearbox occurred when the aircraft was in a maximum power climb. Thankfully, the Navy and Marine pilots ejected safely. Canada representatives then shipped their third prototype to the United States to complete Phase II trials aboard USS Guadalcanal. It would go on to perform dangerous and successful tasks in gale storm conditions. Surprise Cancellation Phase 3 and 4 of the test trials in America were carried out for the remainder of 1973, and despite the two previous crashes, the Dynavert CL-84 proved to be an astoundingly successful aircraft for Canadair. With extensive tests that lasted almost 10 years and glowing reviews by over 40 pilots that flew it, the aircraft had a promising future. It consequently came as a complete surprise to Canadair and the designers that the CL-84 did not win any production contracts. With the end of hostilities in Vietnam, U.S. Navy officials did not envision a military role for the VSTOL tilt-wing aircraft. However, Canadair designer Fred Phillips believed that the primary factor behind the failed sale was that the Dynavert had not been built on American land, nor with American hands. The de Havilland Canada Beaver, Otter, and Caribou loomed as exceptions to the rule. Canadair then tried to sell the aircraft to Germany, Holland, Italy, the United Kingdom, Norway, Sweden, and Denmark, but their attempts were unsuccessful. With no other forthcoming buyers, the company was forced to shelve one of its most innovative creations. By the time of the Dynavert's cancellation in 1974, the three prototypes had flown a total of 700 flights. After storing it in a hangar for over a decade, one of the surviving CL-84s, which made 196 flights and gathered 170 flight hours, was donated to Ottawa's National Aviation Museum of Canada in 1984. Meanwhile, the fourth prototype, CL-84-404, was never fully assembled, and is part of the Royal Aviation Museum of Western Canada's permanent collection. Although Canadair officially closed in 1986, no one can take away that the company became the first manufacturer to successfully develop an aircraft capable of vertical and short takeoff and landing. The VSTOL technology is still used in the aircraft industry to this day with the Bell Boeing B-22 Osprey, which has over 400 models serving the U.S. Marine Corps, Air Force, and Navy. Thank you for watching our Dark Skies video. 
If you know of an aircraft we haven't covered before, please let us know in the comments. And don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell icon to be notified of all our newest content.